Praise God. In an attitude of praise and worship, let us all praise God this morning. Our God is a holy God, and He alone is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Every praise, every praise 
that one more time. If we run to him, he will answer us. If we help to him, he will run to us. If we lift our hands, he will lead us up. Come now, praise his name. Oh, he saves our lives. Oh, sing for joy to God our strength. Oh, sing for joy to God our strength, our strength. Oh, sing for joy to God our strength. Oh, sing for joy to God our strength, our strength. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a privilege to be here this morning. Let us all worship God. God is in our midst. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Welcome to the woman, Women's Conference. We're about to have the special song from the choir. So you guys could please come up. It's the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I hope everyone was blessed by that awesome praise and worship. Um, that's a beautiful way to usher the presence of God. And I just want to thank God because his presence is here. Um, I don't believe in coincidences. Um, we're going to be rendering the same song we rendered yesterday. Um, and when God is saying something to us a second time, he wants us to pay attention. I pray that even as we um, minister, that God will minister through us and that we will all be blessed. And that not only we will be blessed, we will be doubly blessed. I pray that we wouldn't hear our voices, but the Spirit of God will sing through us. And His name, His name, His name alone will be glorified because He has prepared us for such a time as this. And His revival begins here and now. Amen. Some may say it's hopeless, must have never met my God. And some may say it's over, but it was finished on the cross. And some may say it's broken, but the healer's in the room. And some may say it's over, 
but I know God's about to move. God's about to move. There's a miracle in the works, and I can feel it. There's revival in this church. I believe it. It's in ocean, but it's day the highway through. Some may see a mountain, but we see the mountain move. Some may see a graveyard, but we see.
Hallelujah. Someone, do you believe there's revival in the land already? And the Lord is already reviving us. Amen and amen. The Lord is good all the time. I'm just so excited. You're all welcome into the awesome presence of the Lord. He started with us yesterday. He did marvelously yesterday. But who knows that the Lord that we serve is a progressive God, that he goes brighter, higher, better by the minutes, by the day. So today, I know that he has something even better in store for us. Do you believe it? Amen, amen, amen. I want to welcome each and every one of you into the awesome presence of the Lord. I hope you've all been given this um, booklet that we have for you. Do you all have it? If you open into it, you would see what we have prepared for the day. Of course, we are led by the Spirit as well. So whatever the Lord wants to do, we are also open to it. And to welcome you, my dear sisters, I'll just read out what I wrote there. Dear sisters, welcome to the 2022 KCC Women's Conference. Women in time past have been called to step up and step in with boldness and courage whenever the need arose. You would agree that we are in such a season today. However, never before has the call been so urgent and needful. We must arise as women of intercession and progress for our families and for our nation at large. During this conference, we will look at spiritual and practical ways in which we may step up to the plate for such a time as this. Like Queen Esther in her days, we pray that this conference will prepare you and provide you with life tools that will enhance your productivity, your responsibility, your endurance, and your opportunities. This is the set time for the move of God in your life and in your generation. You're called into his kingdom for such a time as this. We appreciate you taking time to invest in your body, soul, and spirit. May you be truly blessed in Jesus' name. And from the depth of my heart, I welcome you. I pray that the Lord will speak to you. He would open your eyes to the things that you never thought were possible in your life. And you start to move with queens and kings. It says you would not walk before mere men. You are moving into the realm of reality in Jesus' name. We have in our midst wonderful, wonderful people, wonderful women of God that the Lord has prepared. Yesterday, we met with um, Pastor Tola Oye. Amen. Let's give it up for Pastor Tola. Wasn't it beautiful yesterday? And of course, I have my friend, Pastor Michelle Todd from Transformation House. You're welcome. And we have also in our midst, Pastor Toi Fafora. If I tell you her story, amen, amen. The enemy wanted to keep her away, but she finally got in at 3 a.m. this morning. 3 a.m. Nothing was going to stop the move of God, and she's here with us. So for Pastor Tola, if you turn to the second page, I said to you I'll introduce her some more. So let me read out what we have about her. Pastor Tola has an accounting degree, MBA, MS, Pastoral Counseling, PMP, CSN. She works as a program manager with Global Manufacturing Company. She has a strong passion for mentoring and training people to live a debt-free life by living on kingdom principles and a realistic budget. She is a volunteer budget coach with the Crown Financial Ministry since 2006 and a facilitator with the Redeemer's Leadership Institute since 2009. A convener of the Mother and Daughter Ministry, Single Mother Ministry, and president and founder of Impacting Lives Foundation. While pursuing her master's degree in counseling, Pastor Tola, who is passionate about the voice, okay, let me read that again. Pastor Tola is passionate to be a voice to create awareness and educate the leadership of RCCG churches on how to handle 
and support and provide tools for mental health issues in our parishes. She's married to her wonderful and God-fearing husband, Pastor Bola, for over three decades, and they are blessed with a set of twins, Tife and Terry. She pastors alongside her husband, a parish of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Joyful Assembly in Juliet. I was corrected yesterday. It's French, but we call it Juliet, right? In Illinois. Let's give a warm welcome to Pastor Tola this morning. Hallelujah. Let somebody shout hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah is too small for God to walk in our midst. Let somebody shout hallelujah. Amen. Father, we bless your holy name. Daddy, we thank you because you are good. You are good. You are good. You are good. We acknowledge your strength in our lives. We acknowledge your grace in our lives. We acknowledge that without you, we can do absolutely nothing. Sweet Holy Spirit, we invite you again to come and move in your power. Come and move in your might. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that every stony heart in this sanctuary today turn into flesh. So that we can begin to live a life such as this at this time. That you will use us individually to be light in our community. In the mighty name of Jesus. Daddy, thank you for what you did yesterday. Thank you for what you will do today. And thank you for what you will do tomorrow. In the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Daddy, I just hide myself behind the cross. None of me, oh God. None of me. Just speak through me. Let me be that vessel that you will use to transform the lives of your daughters, including myself. In the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. While I was sitting down there this morning, um, God wants me to tell you this story. I don't know why he wants me to tell you this story. But I believe that there's somebody here that God wants you to know. Uh, we have a set of twins, and I remember when they were young, I think they were about, they were in high school, about going to college. But then we used to do everything together. When I say do everything together, laundry, cook, do everything. But as God we have, God had a, um, a man of God, he's gone to glory now. He came with his wife to our house for the church program, so we hosted them in our house. Then my husband was doing IT, so he was always traveling around, the, around North America. I don't know what he was looking for. But while I was a weekend, I was a weekend wife, right? He would go on Monday morning, he would come back on Thursday evening. So while this couple was in our house, they had studied me. They looked at the way I was handling the children. Then when my husband came in on Thursday, they looked at the way my husband was handling they now said, we need to talk to both of you. So when the children went to school, they now said, the way you guys are doing, by the time these children go to college, they're going to file for divorce. And I was like, what is he talking about? We're Christians, right? And he said, your life is entangled in the lives of these children. Both of you do not have a life except around these children. They now said, what I'm going to tell you now is that try to separate yourself, couple as one, Children as one. Women, we live for our children. Everything about us is the children. But we have our life. If we're good here, our children will be okay. Most times, we don't take care of ourselves. They said that to us and they left. So my, me and my husband, we talked about this. So the, on Sunday night, we told our children that we're not gonna, I'm not going to wake you up in the morning. You're going to do your own thing. Miss the bus, God bless you. Catch the bus, God bless you. Of course, my husband traveled back on Sunday night, and in the mon on Monday morning, I went to work. I left, and they were sleeping. I got back. It was tough. I got back home. My son made it to school, but my daughter had a good time sleeping at home. <laughs> day two, I didn't do breakfast. I didn't do anything. But around the seventh day, they, they got it. And I thank God, because that separation made me and my husband to discover each other. I made our love to be stronger. I don't know why God wants me to share this story, but I believe there's a woman here today. Your life is entangled around your children. 
As I've told all this story, I pray that the Holy Spirit will minister to you and that you begin to separate yourself so that your children can be who God has called them to be. To be. Another story that God wants me to share. A friend of mine said, sent me a text and said, um, Pastor Tola, I need to talk to you about low, low priority. So I texted, back, texted her back the following day. I said, call me anytime. She didn't call me. She has a son. He's 17, going to be 18, and will begin the college next year. The son, they have a, and the son has an account, but the mom is the one managing the account. So then the son and told the mom, I want to have my own account, and I don't want you to be part of it. She got angry. So I asked her, why are you angry? She said, I won't be able to control his spending. I said, this boy is going to be 18. He's going to college. Are you going to move with him to college? She now said, no. So I said, let me advise you. Let him go and help open his own account. Even if he fails, accountability and responsibility will be by force on him. Many other times as women, we don't want our children to fail. It's when they fail, they get better. We can't keep pampering them. We cannot. As we're enjoying this grace and this strength at such a time as this, let our children to enjoy the grace. And God will help us in Jesus' name. So I just wanted to share those stories with you. I don't know why, but God wants me to share it. Also, there's a woman here. You are having pain. The right side of your knee. It's very, very painful. It's deep inside. Like I said yesterday, when God is doing, when God is performing his healing miracles, I feel it in my body. My right knee has been hurting me since I stepped into this sanctuary. So I want you to know that God is healing you. Receive your healing. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're going to continue from where I started yesterday. Yesterday, I tried to lay a foundation on introductions to such a time like this. Today, I'm going to be looking at the word empowerment. On the flyer, it says empowerment for three days. So that means that God wants to empower us individually. Middle of the night, I kept hearing this word in my spirit. Positioning, positioning, positioning. And I was like, what is positioning? But God wants us to position ourselves for such a time like this. So that when those opportunities come, we grab them. We're not going to be like Jonah that we're going to slip all through. But we're going to grab every opportunity. So what does it mean for Christians to be empowered? If you're, if you're looking at the slide deck, I'm on page, page 6. To be empowered means to have power from above. As a child of God, God has given us that power. So we have that power inside of us. It's just that we have, we have allowed the power to be dominant. We have not done anything about that power. When you have the power of God, you walk in faith. There is no way we can succeed without working in faith. I'll give you a testimony. I have a daughter, like I said, a set of twins. She's a director. She works in the health industry. She's a director. She was a director then two years ago. Last year, they made her a vice president. So she was sharing that testimony with me. She showed me that paper that she wrote it down. She said to God, as she was going to the fourth quarter of last year, that God, I want to be the vice president of this organization. And I want you to carve out a department that they have never had. And I will be in charge. That was exactly what God did for her. They carved out a department for her. And she's running that department. And what again did God do for her? We have been forcing her to go to her MBA, go to her MBA. But at God's time, God makes things perfect. We didn't know she was working behind us. When we gave her pressure, she just left us alone. She asked me, are you going to pay for it? I said, no. Then she said, it's a closed chapter. But she was working. As God, we have it. That same organization, have, the college she wanted to go was New York, NYC. She got admitted. That's this same organization gave her 90% of the tuition. Not only did they do that for her, I'm just trying to encourage somebody here today that this God that we serve, when we allow him to move and we don't have any boundaries around us, but allow him to move, he does marvelous things. She was in Chicago. They moved her to New York. She's going to school. She's, she's working full time. She stays, she stays in New York. They fly her to Chicago every month. As I'm speaking, she got home last night. I'm going to connect with her tonight before she goes back tomorrow. 
So what am I saying all this for, for us to know? Walk in faith. Have your goals. Have your task. Have activities. Know what you want for yourself. You see, the many, many at times, the reason why we don't get to the purpose of God for our lives is just because we, we are lazy. We don't want to do anything. Esther, as we know, was an orphan. She, was, she didn't grow up with a silver spoon. Some of us, we grew up with a silver spoon. That silver spoon has turned to something else because we're just looking at that silver spoon. But as Christians, we all have our individual skills and goals and everything that God has given unto us. God has given us those tools for us to run with. We depend on our husbands. We depend on our boyfriends. We depend on our parents. But I've come to challenge somebody this weekend. Don't depend on anybody. Depend on God. We always say that God first ministry. I tell people, God first in me. Because if I'm mentally sound, I can address my family. If I'm not mentally sound, there's nothing I can do. So after family is ministry. But many at times, we own elder scatter. Some of us, it's our career. Let your career give you peace. You can't be working and working and working and getting all this money, and you're not enjoying it. I was sharing with them, pastors, Pastor Black yesterday, and my auntie this morning. My son, our son, he's solid. He doesn't joke with education. While he was in final year, he started doing his CPA. He got the CPA, immediately graduated from, graduated from college. He did finance, and he minored in Chinese. He speaks Chinese, he speaks German, he speaks Spanish. I don't even know what he doesn't speak. He tried to speak Pastor Black's language, but unfortunately, he got a lecturer, but that did not work. Because he kept changing lecture. I said to him, that, Mom, how come is this Pastor Balaji's language that is so difficult to speak? Because our language does not have those syllabuses. Anyways, so he's a solid person. He started, after college, he went to school. I mean, after college, he got a job. He worked in investment finance for about six years. He was earning good salary. He got to a stage, said he was going to go for his MBA. He went for his MBA and it was a full ride. He got a full ride too. He went for his MBA. After his MBA, he discovered that um, he just didn't want to go to investment and finance again. But as God we have it, he got, a, um, he got a job with the number one game industry. This was a guy that plays games when he was younger. But by the time he got to college, he stopped playing games. Now he's the one designing games for this organization. During his course of his work, he, he, he moved to LA. And in the program, they allow, he's going to do a rotation of nine months. So he chose um, Barcelona, Spain. He went there. He got to Barcelona. He was supposed to finish this September. They offered him a permanent job. We went to visit him July 4th weekend, the weekend of July 4th. And I was talking. He said, Mom, it's not about money. I'm going to pick up this job. He's going to be arriving on the U.S. next week to go to his visa, pay documentation to work there forever. And he's going to move back to Barcelona. Why am I saying all this? I don't know why God is telling me to say all this to you. There are times we try to, de to determine the lives of our children. There are times that we tell them that this is what you must do. Let God be. If that child loves music, celebrate that child. Because God has given that child the grace and the strength to be excellent in whatever that child is doing. We force them to do, med to do medicine. We force them to do law. We force them to do accounting. And they are not satisfied. They cannot live for us. We have our own lives to live. And God will help us in Jesus' name. So let's talk about positioning ourselves. We need to position ourselves for exploits in your career. Are you just there to do 9 to 5 or whatever? There is something that God's want God wants you to do in your career, in that organization. Why don't you sit down and begin to think that what don't they have that I can begin to do? What is their process that I can begin to improve on? It's not about us working nine to five. It's about us working and doing exploits in our organization so that they can know that a child of God, a daughter of God is in that organization. Excellence. What is excellence? You do things, you go above and beyond in wherever you are. I've been in this church since yesterday. All I see is excellence. The leadership, they are excellent. Glory to God. So we come to church every Sunday. Why don't we have that spirit of excellence that God has put inside of us? Why don't we do that? Why do we try to, do sh to short corner things and do things that are not right? 
that is not the God we serve. In your place, when you are behaving in an excellent way, God will promote you. Let's look at the story of Joseph in Potiphar's house. Joseph was depressed. Everything about him shows a life of the world we are in today. He was sold amongst his brothers. His brothers sold him. But when he got to Potiphar's house, the Bible says the excellent spirit of God was upon him. He did everything excellently. He did not look at where he was coming from. He saw where God was taking him to. In your homes, in your marriages, in your life, single mother, single mothers, if you are here, I love you so much. Why do I love you? You are people that we don't take notice of in, in the community. It's not your fault. Whatever has happened that has made you a single mother, but I celebrate you. I celebrate the glory of God upon your life. But we can do better. We can do better. Don't let us keep telling our children the stories about how their dad divorced me, or about how whatever happened. No! Look at your children as gifts from God and do whatever you can do to pour into them so that when they leave home, they're not representing you, they're representing the God that you serve. We need to achieve good success. I am the kind of girl, when you, if you know me, I love bright nail polish. Why? Because light is brightness. And anytime I look at my nails, I say, Tola, you have to show light to somebody. You have to do something to help somebody. I'll tell you another story. There's this lady in our church, we were with you, when she joined the church, her husband had passed. And um, we knew that she was struggling, so I tried to get close to her and everything. All of a sudden, I was in church. She sent me a text, and it was an episode of stories upon story. And she was like, oh, Pastor, you and your husband, you are doing very well. I love you. But for now, I'm going to take a step back. I won't be coming to church until God tells me what to do. That is not the God we serve. God will not tell you not to go to the place of worship. So I left her alone, and um, two days after, I texted her. She did not respond. I called her, kept calling. She didn't pick up the phone. My husband tried. He didn't pick up the phone. So one day, my husband answered, the fifth day, let's try this. My husband and used another number to call her. She picked up the phone. That was when I realized that she had blocked us. So I reached out to the deaconesses in the church, and I told them, please, try to reach out to her and find out what is happening to her life, because I don't want her to be in a dark area where the devil will take advantage of her. On Sunday, the Sunday after, my husband and I said, let's go to her house. We got to the apartment building. We pressed the buzzer. She let us in. We got inside. Apparently, the buzzer downstairs, you won't know who's coming in, but when you get to your door, you can look through the door hole. She saw, she didn't open the door. She did not open the door. Well, the way that I know that God has been working with me is that I don't get angry. I don't get upset. I don't look at people's actions. I just see that God, the devil wants to take advantage of them. That was what I saw. So we left, and that was it. So I reached out to the deaconesses as well. So one deaconess now texted me and telling me that, oh, she has issues. She has financial problems, and she still has to come to the church, blah, blah. To call the long story short, I now decided, let me try this number again. She picked up the phone. And I said, how are you? She said, she started crying. So I said, I have told, give me your resume. She said, I will, Pastor. We did what we could do to her to meet her needs. And I got the resume. It took me three days to rewrite that resume. I was telling my house, I didn't even know that God has given me a gift to write resumes. I we did it and we did it. And it was so beautiful that I was proud of myself. <laughs> I sent it to her. And I told her, please approve it so that I can begin to share with people. She went to it and she approved it. And I just called somebody and I said, please, I need help. And I sent it. That same day, they got her something. You see, many at times we get to a position that the people that God is going to help, use to help us, we shut them down. We shut them down. It's not us. It's just the issue that we are facing. But we need, every woman has to achieve good success. That is the legacy. That is the story that God expects us for the generation that are upcoming, to show them that with God, nothing shall be impossible. We need to have influence in our community. Your community could be your neighborhood. Your community could be your family. What are you doing to influence them? In my family, I'm the least. All what they have, I am the least. But I have a voice because God has promoted me. I didn't go to medical school. No, I did not. But I have knowledge about medicine. 
If they need anything in my house, what well, they say is that I'll be asked taller. Before, before my dad passed, he knew there was something inside of me. I mean, I'm not the kind of person that believes that then that I have to give something to my parents because I thought they were very rich. But until I was in a fellowship like this, and somebody said, oh, no matter how small it is, we have to sow into our parents' life. What did I do? I started buying all this bed in the bag, and I would send to them. I would change their beddings twice a year. And my father is like, Dola, you made me sleep like a king. Well, they were nothing. Talking about that, let me give you a financial tip. You see, we can always look good, but we use common sense, right? I call it that you shop out of season. The things for winter, you shop in summer. The things for summer, you shop in winter. If you have not noticed, those people in the, in, 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 in the retail store, they recycle the clothes. What they pack is what they will bring out, right? I have an identical twin star. We wear almost the same things. I shop for her. She sends me money. And she tells people, oh, Tola, when they say, oh, we like your dress. Oh, Tola's one is on clearance. Mine is the original price. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares, right? She buys her has at the high rate. I wait until it goes to 90% off. And I pick my own, and we have it together. Shop smart. All things that we do must be to the glory of God, right? Everything that we do. Because God has, we are stewards. And God expects that whatever has given unto us, we should use it. We should be good stewards of his finances. All right, let's go to the next slide. I know that time is five ten. I just want to talk about that word empower. As I was preparing for this message, I looked at the word empowerment, and I took empower. What does E mean? E means endowment powers. That means that whatever, Psalm 24 verse 1 says, everything belongs to God. That means that God has given us everything, abilities God has given unto us. The skills God has given unto us. The strength God has given unto us. We don't need to be making excuses again. Because God does not expect us to be lazy. So whatever you need for such a time as this, you have it inside of you. You just need to begin to walk in faith. And begin to walk according to the purpose and destiny of God for your life. We know the story of Joseph in Genesis when there was going to be famine. You know that story. What happened? The president said, who else will we make to be in charge of all these things that Joseph has said? And he said, the person that gave us the idea should be in charge. In your place of work, in your career. Anytime I go to log in, I work from home. Anytime I want to log in into my office in the morning, I tell God that whatever challenges they are facing in this organization, give me the insight and give me the answers so that I can shine. I am shining today because of the glory of God. It is just God. And that is a prayer that we need to pray. That God give me that wisdom to shine. Because of time. Another one is management of skills. We need to manage our skills. Even if, you are the kind, if your skill is business. Maybe you do, we call it bean cake in America. Maybe you do bean cake. Do it with excellence. Do it, package it properly. Package it. Amazon has so many things of, so many packaging that they do that it looks like quality. Package it. Manage those things. Manage those talents. Manage everything. I personally believe that knowledge is not, is not lost. If you need to go back to school, there's so many schools. Coursera. Coursera is a place now they are charging money. But during COVID, it was free. You can do different classes, different courses, just to better yourself. And be a voice in your organization. Let it be that when you don't show up at work, your manager is having headaches. <clears throat> ah, how will I succeed? Because she's not there. Let's be proactive. From now on, do not sleep again. The days of sleeping are over. If you still sleep nine hours a day, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. If you, if you go somewhere, and you, I mean, anytime I go somewhere, I look at the place and I'm like, hmm, what's missing in here that I can do? That's what gives me joy to do. That anything that is missing, I run into it. Do you know that during the COVID, I know somebody. Do you know what they did? All the uniforms that they use in the hospitals, just because of COVID, they can't get it from China. 
She was importing it from Nigeria. This woman has bought three houses within 18 months. We need to begin to think, 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 think. Those ideas are there. Those ideas are there. That's why I said yesterday, discernment, ask God, ask God, ask God, ask God. And our children will not put us into old people's homes. In Jesus' name. We are going to be solid and solid and solid and solid in the name of Jesus. So begin to think. Let's talk about retirement. Some of you are on the fourth floor, you're on the fifth floor. I tell you, for those that are single ladies, young adults here, if you're on the second floor, start thinking of your retirement now. This is now for you to begin to plan. My son tells me every time that, Mom, by the time I'm 40, I'm going to leave the workforce. And he's planning towards it. Let's begin to think, what can we do? Don't be like us in my own generation. That all we do is work, 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 work. Right? Begin to, be, begin to think. Be proactive, be proactive. In your decision making, let's talk about this. God brings us opportunities every day. But we, we are slow to make decisions. Even to make dinner, you are thinking, uh, should I do chicken or beef? What, what is in chicken and in beef? Right? You are thinking through it. Do you know what I do in the morning? When I wake up, I do everything, and I'm about to go to work. I go downstairs, and I, what we're going to eat during the day, I portion things in the freezer. I just bring it out, and that's it. Some of us want to cook fresh. Be wasting your time cooking fresh. God will deliver you. God will deliver you. But you see, what I'm trying, my point is that we waste time to make decisions. We do. Bam, 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 bam. Do what you need to do. Just Holy Spirit, help me, help me. Even if you miss it, God is a good God. He will take you back to that path. But don't waste too much time to make decisions, right? Don't do. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 21, it's, the master's work needs urgency. It has to be urgent. It has to be urgent. You want to refinance your house, it's taking you one year. What is in one year? Just look for three vendors. Pa, 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 pa. And pray about it. God will give you the best person. You want to buy a, a pair of shoes. You are looking around. You are looking. What are you buying? You are spending two hours in the stores. That is why our children, they don't want to follow us to grocery stores. Because we go from aisle to aisle. I don't know what we're looking for. I don't know. You are looking for those things that say buy two, get one free. And I can assure you all, that buy two, get one free. That, you don't, you're not going to use the three. It's only one. It will expire in your... Yeah, whatever. So why are you doing that? Ah, Lord, deliver us. You see, we waste time in things that are mundane, things that are not necessary. That's why our husbands are always angry for those that are married because we are leaving church. and like, ah, honey, let's just stop over and just get, you don't have bread and eggs and you are, you are gone for two hours in the grocery store. Ah. Hmm. I'm going to have mercy. Opportunity. The Bible tells us in Colossians 4, 5, that we should make sure that every opportunity that arises, grab it. Grab it. Grab it. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. If you are here, I tell people, it's your passion that drives that business. What do you enjoy doing? What do you like doing? If you are the kind of, when God was creating me, God did not even give me anything for here or whatever. He did not. So I'm not the kind. But if you are the kind of person that your hands... Can do here, can so close. I was looking at Pastor this morning, my auntie, and I saw the way she has redesigned that t shirt. I said, Hey, if you have the kind of person, begin to think about what you can do. Think about what you can do. There's so many opportunities. Some of us will come here and say, Oh, I don't have the papers. Which papers? You don't have to go travel at America. How many states do we have? How many have you been just Georgia? There's so many things you can do. What I'm saying is that don't limit yourself. Do not limit yourself. There are so many things you can do. Website, people are doing website, people are doing designs and everything. There's so many things you can do. Another one, because of time, wisdom. 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 God has given us wisdom, right? And I tell people, women's wisdom is better than men's wisdom because we can multitask. We can do things better, right? If a man wants to do anything, blah, blah, blah. But we, we think through it, you know, we think through it, we do everything, we package it very well. So I'm going to ask all of us today, when you wake up in the morning, ask God, give me fresh wisdom. Give me fresh revelation. Direct me. 
lead me. And he will do it. He will do it for such a time as this. Because we are all walking into the next level. We are not going to be the same. Testimonies will come out of this prayer conference this year like never before. In the name of Jesus. Even if you are here today and you are in so much debt, it's okay. It's okay to have debt, right? But just have a plan and don't begin to use your credit cards again. Most of us, we've turned credit cards to money. They are not money. They are not money. They destroy us when we don't have plans. What you cannot afford, don't buy it. Simple. If you need it, go get it. But please, what you can't afford, if you want to get out of debt, that's the number one principle. Stop charging those credit cards. I'll tell you a story about myself. I, the, I am the kind of girl, I use credit cards, but I pay off. I have two major credit cards I use, one for United Airlines. You think I work for them, I don't work for them. And one is for Marios, but I do that because I get points. When you see me go on vacation, I don't pay for vacation. It's those points that I use. When they upgrade me in the airlines, they, most times they upgrade me. It's because I have, I have a status with them, and I use my card, and I acquire things with them. So that's one lesson for you to learn. Just do things so that you can begin to enjoy yourself and you don't pay, you don't pay for it. Some of us were here today, our children are going to colleges. They're planning to go maybe next year. Have you asked your children to begin to look for how to get funds to go to college? We don't have to pay for them. There are so many freebies, I call them freebies, out there. But our children, they're so lazy. They don't want to write the essays. That's it. Well, force them to write the essays, and they will do it. And tell them, the money that I will take to send you to school, we can use it for something else. My best friend today, she has three girls. Our last daughter is in college, and honestly, I struggle with it every time I look at her. The school fees when they started in Boston was 40000 They sent a letter, school fees is 70000 I said, girl, what's your daughter reading again? She said... <laughs> It's not medicine. It's not accounting. So I said, what does she want to get out of this class? We need to have a talk with our children. I can't send you to school and pay $70,000. I know you bring that for me. It's, a, it's one course. She said her plan is that she's going to interpret for people in the United Nations. Is the United Nations going to come tomorrow? Let's be smart. Let's encourage our children to do what I will put food on the table. Not because they go to school and I pay for it. No, that is not it. I tell people, if you cannot afford to take your children to school, don't beat yourself down. There are loans there. Get the loan for that child and let the child know that I will pay off and I'm not going to stress out myself, right? But let the child know what's going on. As mothers, there are times we hide things from our children. We can't afford it. We can't tell. We, I don't know why I'm, I'm digressing, but I believe that God wants me to say this. We can't, they want us to do this for them. We can't afford it. Tell them we can't afford it. We are stressing ourselves. We are taking up older, older jobs. Any Sunday that we are supposed to be in church, we are ten, telling them, put my name down. I'll do over time. For what? For what? Because of that child. Let that child know that you can't afford it. That when I can afford it, I will, I will do it. When my daughter was younger, she liked to do all those things. I would, I couldn't, we couldn't afford it. We told her. And now, she, when she got she said, okay, she will ask us, when do you think you can afford it? And I will say maybe in three months' time. And that's it. I will do it in three months' time. We don't have to kill ourselves because, because we want to satisfy them. We are working two, three jobs. We get to the office, we are sleeping, we are, the, the cup of coffee is pouring on the floor because we have not had rest. Let's take care of our body. It's very, very important. When your body is taken care of, you can do exploits. Okay? Excellence. Let's talk about E for excellent performance. We always have to strive for excellence in whatever we do. If it's, that, if it's cooking that chicken, that pot of chicken in the night, strive for excellence. Make sure that you plan it very well and that the salt will not be too much. It's all about excellence. If you are going to bed in the night, I tell people, don't just jump on the bed. Especially when you get to my own level. You can't just be jumping on the bed the way you normally jump. You first of all sit down, take one leg, then take the other leg. It's all about excellence, right? So do what you need to do and make sure that it's excellent in what you are doing. Our God is a God of excellence. 
uh, God expects us to work excellently. Integrity is key to me. I'll tell you a story. Me and my daughter, there was a time we had, there were issues between both of us. I betrayed her trust. And I learned in a very, very difficult way. For two years, it was just, hello, mom, hello, girl, and that was it. I went to God, I cried to God that I know I missed it. When trust is broken, it's very, very difficult to rebuild. But I thank God for, the, for that season because I can use that to encourage people that once you have missed it, just go back to God and God will rearrange it. Today we are best of friends. But those two years were really, really bad. And she taught me what integrity is. Today, when she comes to me and says, oh, mommy, she's dating somebody and she's confiding in me. And I ask her, do you want me to tell daddy? And she says, no, I keep my mouth shut. I keep it shut. If anybody tells me in church, comes to me for cancer and I ask, should I tell pastor? And they say, no, I keep my mouth shut. I don't say anything. But I can put pressure on you and say, let's tell pastor. Pastor has revelation in this area. Pastor can help. If the person says yes, we'll do. If the person says no, I don't. Worst case, what do I do? I write it on the paper and I chew it. And I throw it away. That makes me feel okay that I've said it to somebody. <laughs> Integrity is so key. Please. Please. In your place of work, don't be like those people that they get to the office. You get to the office at 9 o'clock. They are there. You, are, you got there at 9. The person that signed, signed at 6 o'clock, you are putting 6 that. Ah. If any, I've heard of a story that something happened. There was a theft in that organization. The, that guy was not there. He put that time. They put him in jail. Let's be careful. Let's be careful. Don't let us tell lies. We've taught our children, not the people in King's Court. You guys are perfect. But we've taught our children. <laughs> we've taught our children to tell lies. When somebody is calling, tell the person, I'm not home. I'm not home. That child has seen mommy has bipolar. That is why when our children, when they go to college, they don't want to come back to church. Because they've seen that the lives we live at church is different from the lives we live at home. God help us. Be excellent in whatever you're doing. Responsibility and relationship. We need to build relationships. Let's talk about networking. You cannot be in your organization and not network if you want to go far. Somebody told me this when the person was mentoring me. Vice, she's now one of the vice presidents in BP today. She told me then, years ago, she said, to her, anywhere you work, make sure you have two mentors. The first person is in HR. The second person is your boss's boss. You know, there are times your boss does not see your performance. But well, have those two mentors, and that has helped me in my career. We need to network. Don't say that you are reserved, you are quiet. No, network. Know what's going on around you for such a time as this. Because these are the people that will put a word out for you on the time of appraisal or whatever. Always network. Have communities. Join communities. Join different people in your career so that you can advance to the next Next level in your career. Don't just sit down and say, the Holy Spirit will do it. Holy Spirit will do it, but the Holy Spirit expects you to, first of all, take the move. Then the Holy Spirit will align us with other people. Then don't let us look down at people. We don't know what they're going to do. We don't know whatever their seasons are. If you see that somebody is downcasted, all you can do is just pray for that person. And if that person comes to you, don't, like I said, yes, don't just say, God bless you. My God will supply your need. Do something. Do something for that person. And God will bless you mightily in Jesus' name. So as I begin to round up, there are obstacles of time. There are obstacles, fear, laziness, procrastination. Some of us, we have been saying it for 10 years ago, I will do it, I will do it. Now is the time for you to move. Now is the time for you to dust off those books and go back to school and get that degree that will take you to the next place. I'm on the next slide. Some of us, is bitterness. Bitterness. We are so, I don't know who the Joneses are. We compare ourselves with the Joneses. They don't have good lives, though. They don't have God in their house, though. It's the devil that is reigning in the house of the Joneses. You are looking at the brother, and maybe the brother opened the door for that sister. You are telling your husband, can't you open the door for me? Uh -huh. That's that person's season. Enjoy your own, and don't look at other people. Another one is envy, lack of contentment. I'll talk about lack of gratitude. God hates an ingratitude person. Somebody that does not, is not grateful for anything. God hates such, such people. We have to appreciate God. Even today, 
Our beginning might be small. Be thankful to God. Thank God for where you are, where God has situated you. Because God is going to move you higher in the place of gratitude. Appreciate people. Don't take people for granted. Appreciate your friends, your parents, your, your colleagues at work. Appreciate them. Go out of the way to do good to people. And God will bless us in Jesus' name. Then the last slide. Overcoming obstacles of time. Prayer, word, positive confession. Let me just talk about positive confession and I will keep quiet. I am the kind of girl, when I wake up and I used to go to work, before I started working from I look at the mirror. I tell myself, ah, Tola, you're beautiful. Hmm. Tola, you're good. Tola, ah, ah, you have the wisdom of the CEO. I pump myself up that when I get out, nobody can say anything to destabilize me because I've already pumped my mind. I believe so much in confessions. I wake up every morning, I say my confession. On my desk at work, in my office at home, I have confessions all around. I speak, because as the more you speak, the more it comes to reality. Let's rise up on our feet. I want you to talk to God and just ask God that God, please, I am okay with where I am today. Just talk to God. Tell God that you are okay with where you are today. Ask God. Tell God that you should take you out of your comfort zone. Ask God to help in the area of networking. Ask God that he should help you to walk in faith, to believe and to confess and to declare. And to believe that God is taking you higher in the mighty name of Jesus. Daddy, we thank you for your word. Do I know that um, you have moved? I know you have moved in the lives of your daughters. But daddy, I just pray in the name of Jesus Christ that this seed that has sown into their lives, let them begin to run with it. Let it germinate in their lives, oh God. And let testimonies come out of this talk today in the mighty name of Jesus. That you'll be glorified in our lives and it's all about you in our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. God bless. All right. Thank you, Pastor Tola. I don't know about you guys, but I was blessed by the word this morning. So let's give her another round of applause. So one of the themes, so we have a quick icebreaker. And before we get to that icebreaker, I want to um, give a quick testimony and talk about us being here. When I looked at the agenda and I looked at the bios of all the pastors, one of the things I noticed were not only were they doing well in their careers, but they prioritized God's work also. And that sets a statement that you can be very busy. It's all on what we prioritize. And I remember when we started the Women's Conference, we all know that if we look around, it's always the same people doing this work. It's always the same people planning. So three weeks ago, I said, Bonke, do you need any help with the Women's Conference? Not expecting her to say yes. <laughs> but I just felt in my spirit that, okay, you could do more. So try to do more. So then when she called me, she said, oh, tell me, can you help us MC? I said, no, I don't have time. I'm going to be busy. She was like, oh, we, then she could be in epidemiology from UCLA. After, after migrate into the U.S., she worked at the global pharmaceutical company, Allergen, with the focus on eye care, as well for the, um, of, I can't pronounce all these medical terms, <laughs> ophthalmic medical devices company, Star Surgical, before reverting to full-time Christian ministry. Pastor Toyin, who is an ardent worshiper, prayer warrior, teacher, and preacher, currently pastors the RCCG, Jesus Embassy, Los Angeles, alongside her husband, Pastor Nero Fafora. They are passionate about training and equipping the saints in preparation for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's give her a round of applause as she comes up. All right, she's going to come up in just a minute. While we're waiting for her, I thought we were going to do the raffle draw. People are waiting for that raffle draw, so <laughs> it's in their program. They said, yeah, right? Unless you don't have a gift for them. Then if you do have a gift for them, can you do that raffle draw? Then we'll welcome Pastor Tony in a minute.
All right, we're going to do three raffle draws. So this is the first. I'm going to spin, and Bean Boy is going to pick the lucky winner. All right. She's not looking. Pola Shade Agabi. All right, you just want a gift card? We'll do two more. So please, if you haven't filled out a raffle, the ushers have um, raffle tickets. So you can see it's for real. We're not just sticking. <laughs> Thank you. Ma. No, we're doing one now, and then we'll do the rest afterwards. There's one right before lunch, and there's one at towards the end. So you have to stay to the end to get the really big gift card. <laughs> so I know the bio was read of Pastor Toyin. I just want to introduce an usher in again. She's an awesome woman of God. And I don't know how many of you were in King's Court some 15, 16, 17 years ago. Can anyone by show of hand just... Yes, we all had a wonderful, for the newbies in our midst, get ready. The Lord is about to do something great. So let's welcome Pastor Tay Kafora. You're welcome. Yes. Please be seated in God's awesome presence. Our God is good. Oh, we serve an awesome God. I cannot tell you how delighted I am to be here. Because those of you who saw me 15 years ago, I'm surprised that you remember. You know where we were then? You know where we are now? Oh my goodness, it's light years. Our God is awesome. And that's what he's doing in your life too, you know. Day by day by day by day, he's moving you forward taking you higher, changing you, new level, new level, new level, new level, until he accomplishes all that he has planned for you. He said the thoughts that he thinks towards you. He said they're thoughts of good, not of evil. It doesn't matter what you're seeing today. He has a plan for you. He has a hope. He has a future. There's an expectation that he has for you. He has prepared it. And he's at work, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. Our God is a good God. I thank God for the Akindo Jews. <laughs> All glory to God for their lives. And in particular for Pastor Bolaji. You know her name is Bolaji. I call her Brain Beauty plus Jesus. <laughs> BBJ, <laughs> the first lady of KCC, the Lord will continue to bless you. The glory and the lift up of your head will never let you down. The one who has set you above will never let you be beneath. And you will continue to shine more and more brightly onto that glorious day. Our God is an awesome God. You are in the right place at the right time. You worship here, I'm telling you, you are in the right place at the right time. I give God the glory for my sister, my daughter, my Pastor Tola Oye, to the glory of God. You know, when I got the um, flyer, I looked, I said, who? I went and looked up her bio, and I'm like, oh, wow. Um, are you going to talk at the same time as Jesus is going to talk, oh, Lord God Almighty? You're good, and the Lord will continue to increase you. Amen. Amen. But such a time as this, that is the focus of this conference. For us to come to an understanding, to come to a place that there's a need for us to arise and do. There's a need for us to arise and speak. There's a need for us to arise and make change. We have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. You know, the book of Acts, the 17th chapter and the 26th verse it makes it clear that it's God who designs where exactly he chooses to locate each person. 
in certain seasons of time. You are here in, this is not, a, this is not Atlanta, is it? This is greater Atlanta. Uh, Roswell, thank you. You are here in Roswell because God has planned from the beginning of time that that is where you are going to be. So there are certain things that nobody else can do. There are certain words that no one else can speak. You, you have been crafted to say and to do those things in this place. And I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about your life. There's a determination and it is set. God has an expectation. You know, before he created you, he knew what he was putting into you. And Romans chapter 4 verse 12 says this. It says every one of us will give account of himself before God. So God has an expectation. There's a way he has looked and decided and shaped you to do those things. You know, many of us are Nigerians. You know how many in Nigeria, how many people there are in Nigeria? Almost 200 million now, I'm told. The last I knew was 120 million. I don't know how it jumped to 200 million. But why did God choose you out of all those people and then bring you to where you are today? God doesn't do anything by accident. You know, the book of Esther, that book is a very, very, it's a really great book of the Bible. It's so short, maybe 10, I call it nine and a half chapters because the last chapter is so short. So I call it nine and a half chapters. And it's, it's like a rags to riches story. You know, you could match it with Cinderella or uh, My Fair Lady or even, you know, Meghan Merkel before everything came down <laughs> around her. Because it's the story of a young girl that suddenly became a world power. Suddenly, overnight. And when you read it, it's almost like a fairy tale, but there's something about the word of God. Every word in that book is true. Every word. The word of God says that all scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, it says that all scripture is God-breathed. That's the interpretation I like. Others say it's inspired. And he said it's given for doctrine, that is for teaching. It's given for reproof so that we know where we're not quite right. It's given for correction so that where we're not quite right, if we like to choose, we can change and become right. And it's given for instruction, that is training in righteousness. So teaching and training for reproof and for correction. So if that book of Esther is in the word of God, that it means that there's a word there for you and for me. That is supposed to do all of those things in our lives. It's worth reading. You know, the first chapter of that book, it describes a party. I thought we Nigerians like to party, but Persians do it better. That king... Do you know how long that party lasted? I'm telling you six months. Six months. And then, as if six months was not enough, he now had a seven-day party for the people who were working during the six-month party. But that series of events, I don't like to call it a story. It's like a horror story. You know, if you watch horror movies, it always starts with the sun shining on a lake in a peaceful atmosphere. You know what I'm talking about. And then suddenly, <laughs> everything changes. Everything. Because when you read the book of Esther chapter 9, verses 24 to 25, you find a prece of what happened in the book of Esther. Esther chapter 9, verses 24 to 25. I probably have put it up. Okay. Okay, it's up. Thank you. So the 24th verse, it gives us a situation. The horror that came about after that wonderful party, after the disobedience of a queen and the disobedience of a man. Because Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, 
had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them. And he had cast pure, that is the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. That was the plan. When we start with this great party, and then suddenly we find that not just one person, but a whole nation of people. You see, the Jews, they belonged in Palestine. That was their place. But they were conquered by the Babylonians. And then over time, the Persians came and took over. And many of them escaped, or they were brought captive to different places. So this city where Shushan, it had a good number of these Jews who were living there. They were nobodies. They were classless. They were below what is described here. Am I standing in the wrong place or something? Okay. It's like Trump suddenly waking up when he was in power and deciding that every Nigerian, that he didn't care about all other black people, every Nigerian, he wanted them out of the United States of America. And if you could trace their roots back to Nigeria, whatever, whoever they had married, whatever they had done, he wanted all of them out. That's the kind of picture that it was. That every single one of those Jews, they were to be annihilated means all of them must expire, they must all be killed. But the very next verse... You see, we serve a God, oh, who is all-powerful. There's nothing that he cannot do. The very next verse says, but when Esther came before the king, I like that phrase. I like that phrase. There's a phrase I love seeing in the Bible when it says, but God. Oh, once you see, but God, you know, Ava, <laughs> my father has entered the matter. Everything has changed. This one says, but when Esther went before the king. Let me say, but, and you say, when Esther went before the king. But, 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 that was all it took. We're talking about annihilating a whole nation full of people. We're not talking about an ordinary circumstance. We're talking about a, a circumstance of national proportions. But, when you go before the king. When you go before the king. What a king. You know, four characters that we can look at in that book of Esther. There's Mordecai. Mordecai, high born. He could trace his roots back to Benjamin, son of Jacob. That's how high born he was, where he was coming from. But like many of us, I saw a doctor yes, two days ago. They bought, they bought a place. And the wife insisted I must come and pray. And the doctor has, he came into the United States just before COVID. And he was all, you know, I, I was praying and he was standing there and he was carrying his bag and he was, but no, you know where he was going? Security guard. He's not just a doctor, he's a specialist, he's an ophthalmologist. Or a security guard. But it's for a season. <laughs> Weeping may endure for a night. But joy, <laughs> oh, it is by force, by two lasses. Uh, so, Mordecai, what was he doing in Shushan de Palace? Security guard. He was at the gate, but he did not allow that to block his vision. Because that man, he had a niece. So number one, we said that he was high born. Number two, we say he was very perceptive. He was a risk taker. You know, Pastor Oye kept telling us, he said, look, you have to take risk. If you were listening on the inside, between the lines, many of the things that she was saying, she said, you have to take risks. You have to change. You have to be prepared to move. They were bringing beauties into the palace. You know the story, so I'm not telling the whole story. There's no time. They were bringing beauties into the palace. This man who was brought captive, this man who was virtually a slave, he was just walking at the gates. 
<laughs> they were bringing princesses, and he went and brought his niece. Audacity. Yes, you need audacity. Oh, I have a daughter, a daughter in the Lord. She's an excellent photographer. And you know, I kept telling her, you do, I said, enter for this competition. Say, I don't have paper. Ah. When will you not have paper? Enter for the competition, my friend. Excuse me, oh my goodness. <laughs> enter for the competition, my friend. Paper or no paper, it, your talents will become clear. She never answered though. She's finally gotten her papers and answered. <laughs> Where is the risk in that? On the other hand, I have another daughter. Hey, this child. She entered medical school. Okay. Let, let me wait until we talk about imposter syndrome for a few seconds. So we're saying that number one, this man, high born. Number two, a risk taker. Number three, he was very connected. You know, one of the things that Pastor Ye said, that you, the last things that she, she said, it's a takeaway. That you need to be connected. No man is an island. No man stands alone. Nobody. We don't. You have to be connected. This man had an ear to the ground. And you know, information, yeah, I, I don't really like it very much. Because information, you have to trade. Before somebody tells you something, you have to tell them something. <laughs> you know? But the people who are the master, my husband is a master of that art. This man, I'm sure he was among the first people that knew that there was going to be, they were going to recruit all those uh, virgins into Shushan. How did he know how much a man gave the king? How did he know? Because when Esther sent her touch to go and meet him, he told him three things. He told him, number one, this is what happened to me. Number two, this is how much a man gave the king for us to be killed. And then number three, and don't forget that in those days, writing was not cheap. It's not something that you see everywhere like we see it now. He gave her the written paper of what Haman had sent out. How did he get all those things? He was well connected. That is who that man was. And then the fourth thing about him is that he was not ashamed to cry out to when there was fire on the mountain. He didn't keep quiet. You know, Pastor Oye gave an example of the lady that I don't want to tell anybody. Oh! <laughs> he rent his clothes. He put sackcloth and ashes. And he went to the very, very, he took the, to the, to the king's gates with a loud and bitter cry. He didn't hide things. So you hide it. What is it that the world has not seen before? What trouble is it that you think that is only me? Ah, life is not like that. Don't let the devil keep you in a corner. But that's Mordecai. Then Esther. A nobody among nobodies. That's nobody of nobodies. An orphan taken up by her cousin. That was her identity originally. Voiceless. No voice. And then was obedient. You know, Mordecai will, um, Mordecai will say this. She will do it. Mordecai will say that. She will do it. There's no time to go into the story. She will do it. She was obedient. She was favored. We'll, we'll talk about the reason in a second, I hope. But she was favored, and I may forget. And then she was beautiful to look upon. When they said she was beautiful, I said, who is not beautiful? Look at yourself. I like how Pastor Tony said, I talk to myself. Look at yourself. I am beautiful. Ah, look very, very well at yourself. I am beautiful. Look, that king's at Asaxis, his region was from India to Ethiopia. Tell me, where are the most beautiful women in the world? India, thank you. India, and then the seven woman is the most beautiful. How do you count which one is the most beautiful? Uh, black is beautiful. Uh, yellow is beautiful, white is beautiful, everything in between, long hair, short hair. There's some people that are plump and they're so beautiful plump and they're busy trying to, you know, I had to tell, there was a girl in the choir, I had to call her, stop this trying to diet. This, this, you are beautiful. Psalm 139. I'm not going there. <laughs> I okay, well, I but with all seriousness, you are beautiful. Yes, you are beautiful. You are. So don't ever look at yourself and say, or say, if not for this. Uh -uh. Mm. You are? Amen. In any case, 
and um, Esther. She arose when there was a time, when there was a need to arise. Now, when you read the word of God, it's always good to insert yourself into it. You know, sometimes you read about the feeding of the 5,000. So you insert yourself among the women who were there that day. And you imagine how Jesus said, sit in the grass and how you sat and how they handed out the bread and then you collected the fish. You do that, right? I call it sanctified imagination. It's always good to use your sanctified imagination. Put yourself in the story. So if we put ourselves, we'll just, just put ourselves quickly in two people's shoes, Mordecai's shoes and Esther's shoes. Mordecai. The whole book of Esther, they didn't need to write that book. Sure you know. They did not read to, need to write that book because the king gave an order. He said, when Haman passes, do what? Bow. Is that hard? Somebody tell me. When a man passes, do what? <laughs> Is it hard to bow? I don't know what was wrong with Papa Modikayo. And you know, sometimes those of us in diaspora, sometimes a screw comes loose. If they knew who I was and where I am coming from. Ah, I had one, I had one. You know, I went after PhD, I went and did an internship in Alagan. I had this girl. She's a lesbian. She had this glorious blonde hair, and they put her in charge of me. <laughs> and then she gave me, one day she, she, she gave me three things to do, and I looked at the three things, and I, she told me, do this one, then do this one, then do this one, and I looked at the three things. I said, this one will take me a minute to do it, so I did that one first. I said, this one will take a little bit more time. I did that one second, and then the one that I need to settle down, I settled down and did it. As I was doing, she was walking, and I, I like, me. me that had a secretary and an office, where I'm coming from. I was sitting in cubicle after that PhD. That didn't last long. They moved me to an office to the glory of God. But let us, anyway, sir, then I'll be sitting in the cubicle and then she'll be passing behind me and be, ah, like you gave me. Hey, Fada! Fada! So when she now looked at these things and she saw that I did not do them in the order that she did them in, she now called me. Me! Ah, that day I said, Father, America. <laughs> you, when you were in diapers, I was already saving lives. I was sitting in the ER. I was making life and death decisions. You, ah, uh, So maybe it was that screw that went wrong in Mordecai's head that day. Who knows? That they said, bow to this man. And it's the king that said it. This same king, when Vashti, when, when the Vashti disobeyed, you know what happened? They said Vashti was never coming to the presence of the king again. And then everything that pertained to her, everything that she got because she was the king's wife, they took everything away from her. That same king now said bow to somebody. And you will not simply bow and go your way. Ah, that screw went off that day. <laughs> and the result is the book of Esther. Mordecai. And you know we're like that. I didn't last long in, actually I did. Let me not put it that way, I did. In fact, I lasted longer than the whole team because they moved us out. There was a takeover, takeover bid in the world of <laughs> America, corporate America. So they had to cut out the whole department. <laughs> oh my goodness. But I didn't have an easy time there. Why? Because they would do things and I think, hey, pardon me, hey, me. Me? I didn't have an easy time there. It was not easy. It was not funny at all. But see this man. He made that decision. He was not going to bow. And the result of it was not just for him. Because you see, when you go crazy, you meet people who are crazy, I say, you know. Ah, when you are proud, you meet people who are more proud than you, I say, you know. Because he now met Haman. Haman must have been very good at his job, oh. And Haman must have known how to network and be very close to his boss's boss. <laughs> Amen? And the king really... And then he now went and offended that one of all the people he had loved. It was a mistake. Because Haman had the power not to punish Mordecai alone, 
but to punish all of the people. He went to and reported to the king. He did not say Mordecai did this. He said there are people who do this and they must all go. That's how you and me, sometimes we create mess for ourselves. We fight fights that we don't need to fight. I was walking along the road. I live in Orange County in Irvine. And we have a lot of biking trails. I was walking along the road. The biking trail has a painted line on either side, maybe just to mark the edges of the trail. I was walking along my road, Jeje, and this Oibo woman was coming. And I, I stayed on that line. I was walking in the shade. I stayed on that line. And I was just going along. And this Oibo woman was talking to her friend on the phone, talking to her friend on the phone, coming towards me. And I was expecting her to move over, and she didn't move over. Until she came and she stood in front of me. And she was talking to her friend. She is standing in front of me. She is, you know how they, uh, she is. And I just stood there, I was just smiling, waiting for her to move around. And then she looked at me, she said, I'm not going to move. I've got all day to stand here. Initially, you know, you know when you meet resistance, you want to fight resistance. Initially, I just folded my arms and I was smiling at her. One second, two seconds, three seconds. She said, I've got all day. I said, well, I don't, and I think you're silly. And I just <laughs> moved on and continued my walk. You know, sometimes we fight fights that we don't need to fight. We pick up things that we do not need to pick up. And then those things affect other people in ways that they do not need to affect them. That's what happened with Mordecai's matter. And some of us are in messes like that. Because we have fought fights that we do not need to fight. We have done things that we did not need to do. But Mordecai knew where to go. He had disobeyed the king. He knew he needed to get to the king. It's like when we sin, we know that we need to get to, to the king. Right. But he couldn't get into the palace. He did not have the king's ear. But he knew somebody that had the king's ear. Esther. She was there in that season of life. So we can look at Esther as a type of Christ. So we see Mordecai as a kind of you and me, a sinner. A sinner. Find it, always find it easier to do what is not right than to do what is right. Even in spite of the fact that the Lord himself is sanctifying us and we're in that process. Even though he has declared us saints. But let's look at Esther. Because Esther, when Mordecai sent to her, this is what is happening. And you need to go and talk to the king. She said, talk to the king. Number one, that king is not looking for air. Because 30 days now, he has not sent for me. So he's not looking to put an air on the throne. If you think that maybe I'm his favorite in any way. Then number two, everybody, the whole world knows. And everybody in the palace, if I should even try it, they know that if you go there without your head will roll. Except, and God always, the word of God says, he, look, he will always provide a way of escape. I don't care what corner you think the devil has painted you into at this moment. Ah! Just before I came, the very close... A, a very close daughter came up and said, I need so much. I'm down to my last. I have. And as I'm standing before you now, after that, she has traveled. She has done uh, some, uh, a, 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 um, an event that she needed to do. She is back. She's still living her life. So when we think that we're painted in a corner and it is the very, very end, it never is. Why? Because God always makes a way of escape. So if you think that you are painting in, it is a lie of the devil. A L I E. You are free. Whom the Son sets free, John 8 32, is indeed. Never allow yourself. So she sent that word back. That's the only, that, that, this is, that was when Mordecai sent back the message. But you, you think that you are in that place, you think you are going to escape? You know, just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he cried out before the Father, when his 
sweat was like drops of blood. So let this cup pass. Let this cup, let this cup pass. The same way was how Esther cried out and said, Ah, this thing that you want me to do is going to mean death. It's going to mean death. It's going to mean death. And he sent a message back to her. <laughs> that is, and so, it's going to mean death. Mean death. And so, I mean, you're one person. We're talking about a whole nation. So we see Esther as a type of Christ. That is why that scripture, Esther 9.25, but, 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 Because when she came before the king, everything turned around. And this is where I'm going. When you come before the king, everything turns around. Everything. Four things. Prayer. In coming before the king, prayer. 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 Number two, the words of our mouths. Number three, our actions. And finally, death. But let me speak first about prayer. You see, where you are, all around you, are different, different Mordecais in different, different troubles. Now you are saved, you are sanctified. God is at work in everything concerning you. Even if you never prayed again, everything will be fine. Uh -uh. I'm telling you the truth. You don't believe it? Because he's your father. Even if you never, ever again ask God for anything. You find it difficult to believe. I'm telling you the truth. If you never ask God for anything for yourself again, everything will still be fine. Everything will still be fine. If you never opened your mouth and said, God, please, this one, that. So we spend a lot of our time, our prayer time, crying out, God, please, God. And it's all about us. But you cannot be a, but you cannot have that effectiveness if all you pray about when you pray is about yourself. You can't. You can't. You cannot. You have to carry the concerns of others. That's what you are called to. You have to carry the concerns of others before the king. Yes, a few years now, I was lying in bed. L let me just take one of the examples. There's several. But let me take one of them. Lying in bed and talking to God about. This was years after I had left Nigeria. But there was a set of patients that I feel very sorry for. They have a disease called glaucoma. They go blind, but you don't know they're going blind. And when it's inherited, it often occurs in younger people. And I hate to see young people go blind. And that night I was just telling God, that you, I said, that awful disease. You know, I wouldn't mind really doing something about it. I don't know what to do, but I would not mind. Just in talking to him as, you know how you talk in your quiet time? And a few weeks later, I was at my desk. I was working in the CLA at the time. And there was what is called a request for proposal from the National Institutes of Health. Wanting a collaboration between a third world university and a university in the United States. So I wrote a proposal. To cut a long story short, I got the grant to study, uh, to do a study in juvenile open angle glaucoma in Nigeria, between Nigeria and between the University of Ibadan, where I used to work, and, um, and UCLA, where I was working at the time. I'm saying every time you carry your concern before God, He listens. We spend so much of our time talking about what, you know, about my daughter, my son. I have five daughters. And I'm the first of six children, six. So you can imagine what my prayer, <laughs> if I allow it, what it would be. Excuse me. And then we pastor a church. So you can imagine what my prayer life would be. But no, I learned something. I like to read and I learned something from a book. It's called Prayer Box. Prayer Box. Prayer Box. So when I have a prayer concern, and I'm not talking not about me, not about my children, not about my brother, not my sister. I write it down. I write a letter to God. And I put it in that prayer box. 
And when it's time to pray, I go over the, the, the prayers in the prayer box and talk to God about those things. Sometimes he'll say to me, do something. Sometimes he'll say to me, call this person. Sometimes he'll say, sometimes he'll give so-and-so this. Sometimes, you know, just different instructions of what to do. Why? Because those people, they're there to remember to pray for them. It helps to make, it helps make a very, very big difference than to sit down and be praying about me, myself, and I. One of the easiest things over the years, what I really enjoyed with always having a prayer partner across the years, somebody was, it was you that said you have a best friend. Like, oh my goodness, I wish I had a best friend. I haven't had a best friend since I came to these United States. Everybody works so hard. <laughs> so I don't know how you and your friend manage. But seriously, one of the things I, I enjoyed about, you know, Jesus sent his disciples out two by two about praying with somebody else was that we never prayed only about ourselves. Always we prayed, prayer, it's so exciting. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Prayer is very, very exciting. And I'm going to talk particularly about listening prayer. Because what makes prayer exciting is when you talk and you make sure you listen to what God is saying. Let me take a second to say about one of, with one of my prayer partners. Uh, we were praying one afternoon. And, you know, when you're praying in the Spirit, sometimes your prayer becomes very, very intense. And... You know, somebody's name came up, a lady's name came up, and our prayer became very, very intense. This is many years ago. It became very, very intense, and we prayed for her. And when we felt the, you know, the burden lift, you know what I'm talking about, right? When we felt the burden lift, we stopped. And then that was on a Tuesday. On the Thursday, this lady that we prayed for walks into the fellowship with a collar around her neck. What had happened? She had been in an accident. Her car had been totaled. And the only thing was that she had a little bit of pain in her neck. And when we asked, what time did the accident take place? Just guess. On Tuesday at the time that we were praying, yeah. So praying with somebody makes all the world of difference. I haven't had anybody to pray with like that in years. So this has really helped having a prayer box. Pray about others. When Esther came before the king, you will find yourself making a difference. I'm not going to start telling you stories of what came out, what has come out, and what I'm hoping will even come out more from this. Because God will keep speaking and telling you what to do. So prayer is one thing. Then the words of our mouth. Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 26. It says this. I saw it on the, on the bathroom door. I talk about excellence in this church. But the 26th verse of Proverbs 31 says, She opens her mouth with wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. When you're constantly in, when you're constantly coming before the king, when Esther, but... Okay, now let's put your name in. But, 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 if you want to make a difference, you have to go before the king. Because he'll put words in your mouth. You'll speak those words and say, Did I, am I the one that said that? <laughs> am I the one that said that? You know, there are meetings where people will not be able to hold the meeting unless you're there. Because they know that you're going to say something that's going to make all the difference. You know, and sometimes, you know, there are places where I want to, I'm an older person, excuse me. There are times when I just want to talk like that. I don't know. <laughs> she opens her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue. And I'll find myself, you know, those words. And then the way, the attitude and the words that I use, I'll find a whole organization, whole organization, turning around what they planned because of what I said and how I said it. So, number one, prayer. Number two, the words of our mouth. And number three, our actions. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and... Ephesians 2.10. Let me leave 8 and 9 alone. Ephesians 2.10 is a scripture I love. It says, for you are God's workmanship. But when you read it in another version, it says you are God's masterpiece. That is who you are. You are God's masterpiece. There's nobody else like you. Nobody. And you are not just ordinary. You are a masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. And you were created unto good works which God has before time determined. I need you to believe it. That it's not all about your mortgage or your rent or how much 
I don't know. What are the things that bother people? There's so many things that bother us. It's not all about that. What it is all about is that you came into this world and you're going to leave this world. And when you leave, you're going to give account not about how many hours you work or how much overtime you did, not about um, your relationship with your, I don't know, whatever. You're going to give account of what God expected that you would do, the things that he had preordained that you're going to do on the face of this earth. So to be able to do those things, you need to enter before the king because he will speak to you. He will tell you what to do. He will give you direction. God is never, he's not silent. We don't serve a silent God. Time fills me to give example. I don't think it's a good time, but tomorrow maybe. To give an example of what I'm talking about. I'm speaking to you and saying, look, the actions that you take. But when Esther, when you enter before the king, he gives you direction concerning your actions. And the last thing is death. Death. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. There are things that... 2.20. Galatians 2.20. There are things that you will never be able to do. And these are things that God has written against your name if you do not die. You have to... You have to die. When you die, there's so many things. Again, Pastor Tolo, she, she, she said, Pastor and Pastor's wife, they went to visit this person and the person, they were standing there. <laughs> the person did not open the door. Habba. But you know, you just, it just rolls off you. Why? Because you, had, you have died. You are dead. Unless you die, there's much that you will not be able to do. John 12, 24, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and he said it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Let us pray. Only your grace. Only your grace. Only your grace can take us to where you want us to be. We are so concerned, we're so bothered about many things. You said about Martha, said, Martha, Martha, you're cumbered about with many things. And that is exactly how we are, cumbered about with many things. But only one thing is needful. And we want to choose the better part. But we can only choose it by your grace. Because there's so much that grips our hearts and keeps our knickers in a permanent twist. So much that keeps us lying awake at night. And yet all of those things will pass away. So much that occupies our time and our thoughts. Excluding what you want us to give time and thought to. By the time we're done with all of the words of life that have been spoken to us in this conference, our priorities will change. As we go before the king, our priorities will change forever. The kingdom that you have brought us into for such a time as this, you will not be disappointed. All that we need to do, we will set our hearts on the things that are above. We will refuse to be mired down by these things that seem so big and in reality they're so petty. They mean little less than nothing. You'll cause us to see as you see. You'll open our eyes to perceive and to understand. You'll open our hearts and fill our hearts with strength, with faith, with understanding. 
we will not fail you. You have not brought us so far just to let us down. Your grace will suffice. We will not fail you. You have brought us from our individual walks of life to the point where we are at today. The plan, the purpose that you want us to fulfill, we will not fail you. Because your grace will suffice. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, glory. Hallelujah. Awesome, awesome, awesome.